remain standing and uh, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper and I would like to have you uh, read along me with me a confession of our faith and we'll have that up here on the screen right away and so okay here we go no okay okay Today, whenever we do celebrate the Lord's Supper, and one of the things that's good to do is to confess our beliefs in God and in what He's done. And so as we do that, we are going to uh, confess together as soon as they load it. Uh, and uh, we're going to say this because it's a summary of our beliefs that as we talk about uh, counterfeits today, it's going to be important for us to understand what is truth, true truth, and that comes through Jesus Christ and our belief in Him. And so as we do that, we're going to go ahead, and let me just go ahead and get it started for you, and then we'll go from there. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, was suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and it sits now at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he's going to come to judge the living and the dead, and I do believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come now and with that confession of faith. And Lord, if there are those that don't know you and don't understand, Lord, we just ask that they would ask you and that you would give them the clarity that they need to confess you as Lord and Savior because it was on that cross that Jesus died and paid the price, the crimson blood did flow for us and was totally effective so that by believing in Him, we could come back and have a relationship with You, Father. And so we're thankful for that. We ask You to be with us now. Bring to remembrance Your grace, Your forgiveness, and everything. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So one of the things I want you to know is that this Savior was foretold by Isaiah the prophet. And so in Isaiah's passage, Isaiah 53, it says there, I, just one thing that really struck me, he was despised, that's Jesus, he was despised and we did not care. How many people stood there and watched while Jesus paid the price? A lot of them. But he was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, just like sheep do, have gone astray. We have left God's paths to follow our own. We thought we knew better. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never whined. He never said a word. Also, we can tell that because of the death that came in through the first Adam, the sacrifice of Christ for us was totally necessary. And so in Romans 5, it says this, and halfway through the passage, it says, For Adam's sin led to condemnation from God, but God gave us a free gift that leads to our being made right with Him, even though we are guilty of many sins. We are all guilty. For the sin of that one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. Cancer came in with Adam's rebellion. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and His gift of righteousness. For all who receive that gift will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus taught us how to pray. And so let's pray this together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward at this time. And we're going to distribute the elements. And if you would hold on to them and we'll all partake together. It's a great opportunity to share a covenant meal. The one that Jesus instituted. So I want you to think about what God has done for you. What Christ has done for you during this day and time. Think about it. The new life that you have. The life that is growing. The life that is changing you. And the life that is moving you from where you were to where God wants you. And so we prayed in that portion of the Lord's Prayer. And we call it that because that's what He taught us to pray. And so as we pray that, we realize that we want the heaven up there to come down here and to be part of our lives. And so it's going to mean a change for us because before we we're alien and hostile to God, but He has made a way for us by believing in Him will receive that life and have it more abundantly. You see, one of the things that people think is that just to... Uh, accepting Jesus Christ means I get life in eternity. Yes, that's true, but that's only part of it because you get a life now. Like we've sung so many times, there is no fear with God, only reverence towards Him, allegiance towards Him. He is the one that has set us free from all of the fears of what other people think, fears of what we don't know what we're supposed to do, all of those things have been taken care of in God because He will show us through His Word, through the fellowship of positive people, He will show us how we can worship Him and find the answers to life. They are there in principle and they are there in fact. They are explicit and they are, they are for us to be able to live the life that God had for us. So as we come this morning, we just need to think about, am I a new creation in Christ? Am, do I have a new paradigm for my life? And the answer is yes. What do I have in Christ? I've got everything. And so as we think of this this morning, let us just go ahead and focus on what God has done for us and what we need to do for Him, which is to love Him and to serve Him. Now, Paul, the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, what he did was he told them, don't get drunk before you celebrate this meal. Don't let your poorer brothers starve while you're gorging yourselves on food. This is a covenant deal to remember what Jesus has done. It's part of community. It's not part of a selfish uh, or uh, It's not part of a selfish... Uh, uh, type of meal where you're going to gorge yourself, it's different. And so the difference is this. He says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord Himself. On the night when He was betrayed, the Thursday night, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then He broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And so this is just a symbol of of his body which was broken for us the brokenness of his body means that we are going to get life because not only was his body broken but his blood was shed and so that sacrifice was full and complete he didn't swoon on the cross he was dead the man died but jesus the god did not he rose again on the third day and so whenever we partake this bread, we need to remember what this means for us. And so as you partake of this today, you remember what Jesus has done, will done, and is going to do for you. You may partake. Now one of the Passover traditions that they had was that they would always have a cup after supper. And that's what this was, was a Passover celebration 
Just like whenever God brought the Israelites out of Egypt and brought them out safe and yet killed all the firstborn of Egypt, those that didn't obey God and put the blood on the doorpost, obedience is a large part of blessing. Then what he did was he said this, in the same way he took that cup of wine after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with his blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. The Lord died and rose again. You may partake. Stand with me if you would, please. O oh, merciful God and Father, we thank you with all our hearts that in your boundless grace you have given us your only begotten Son as a mediator and a sacrifice for our sins and as our food and drink unto life eternal. We thank you too for giving us the true faith through which we can partake of all your benefits. And since your Son, Jesus Christ, ordained the Holy Supper to strengthen our faith, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, this supper may increase our faith and enrich our fellowship with Christ. May you also use this proclamation of our Lord's death and resurrection to bring others into this blessed fellowship with him so that all your children may be gathered in to share with us the joy of your salvation. Hear us, O Heavenly Father, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me talk to you today uh, out of 1 John. And I've been concerned in these life words that we've been doing that sometimes we can get too esoteric and sometimes we can get too philosophical and we can miss what the Apostle John is saying to us. And it's a tough one to do because Apostle John is writing it when he's 85 or 90 years old. And so what he's talking about in this passage today, and we'll get to it shortly, but what he's talking about here is beware of false prophets. Beware of those that look like uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. By the way, it doesn't work very well the other way. Sheep cannot disguise themselves in wolves, wolves' clothing. That doesn't work. Okay, so we know that counterfeits, false teachers, and everything else have been around for a long time. Anytime God does something, the enemy is going to do something that is a counterfeit. And so what we need to do is understand, and then a little bit later, I'm going to help you understand how to sort things out, and we'll use some illustrations. But I was amazed that whenever I looked at God's Word, I found that there were 73 verses for all of you verse counters. There are some people who get, judge uh, the importance of a topic by how many verses it has. And so this one has 73 verses. So if you're a verse counter, this is an important topic. Ever since Mount Sinai, when God told Moses, Thou shalt have no other gods before me, the first commandment. The second, Thou shalt not make any graven images of any likeness of anything. People have drifted off the reservation. I mean, they really have. So here, if you look at these, if you look at these references, You'll see here in these that it's, it's pretty significant. Deuteronomy says this. Uh, if somebody says something that I did command, this is God talking, or who speaks in the name of other gods, well, I'll come to you in the name of Molech, the guy's got to die. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a real removal. And so it's one of the voices that we constantly hear is voices of other gods. Hey, it's okay, you know. We're all going to the same place, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So we constantly hear these kind of things. And uh, so in Jeremiah 23, I like this. This is what the Lord of armies says. Don't listen to those who are giving you false hope. If people are giving you false hope, like if you elect so-and-so, everything's going to turn out right. Really? Guaranteeing that? No, the answer is no, it's not. So that's false hope. No matter what letter you have after your name, D, R, I, L, whatever it happens to be, then there, that's a false hope to hope in the political process. You're supposed to engage in the political process, but it's not the place. And beware of false prophets. What's a false prophet? We'll get to that. 
But one of the things that they produce that Jesus says is they're going to manipulate you. They're going to manipulate you. And so whenever they manipulate you, they get you to do things that you otherwise would not do, but things that they want you to do so that they can gain from it, oftentimes monetarily. And so even Peter in 2 Peter 2 says this, but there were also false prophets among the people. What people? The people that God brought out of Egypt. And so there's also going to be false teachers among you. Like I said, anything that God does, the enemy counterfeits immediately. And he tries to get you to move away from God and move towards him because it'll make God look bad. Okay? That's why sometimes you say the word Christian and people go, ooh, those are nasty, mean, hating people. Really? Is that what you are? Nasty, mean, hating people? No. No. Okay? And then Jude, the book of Jude, one chapter says this. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They're godless men. They changed the grace of our God into a license for immorality and denied Jesus Christ, who is our only sovereign and Lord. So we deal oftentimes with people who say things that really sound good, but they aren't. But most of the time what we do is we deal with counterfeits in the physical <coughs> realm, not so much in the spiritual realm. So I want to show you what I mean. So if we look at these items here, up over here, have you ever been to the store and they take a pen and they mark your bill? Ever had that happen? I watched at Walmart the other day. Well, you use a debit card. Uh, so I wonder if they mark debit cards. So the other day I was over at Walmart, and uh, I looked back there in the camera section, and there was a lady with some big bills going like this, you know, trying to see what the identifying marks were. Well, if you do that, or if you're using paper that is not government, then your mark will look like that. So no go. Here comes the Secret Service to arrest you. Do you know that the Secret Service that protects the president was originally formed by Abraham Lincoln to stop counterfeiting? It's a little fact for today. Okay. Hey, would you buy a Rolex from this guy? How about a Movado? How about a Breitling? Okay. Hey, look at these. Nike. N K I E. Anything wrong there? Can't even spell Nike. Can't even fake it. Good. Okay. How about this one over here? Here's a Burberry bag with a Kate Spade counterfeit sticker on it. Double counterfeit. You like Burberry or Kate Spade? Neither? Okay. All right. Now, here's how you tell on a Louis Vuitton bag. <laughs> Did I get that right? Okay, Louis Vuitton. Okay, here's a counterfeit. Look at this. You can't really tell right away, can you? Because the print on the fabric looks the same. But if you look, look at how many stitches there are running down this way. Look at how many stitches there are. Stitches, stitches, stitches all over the place. And look at the buckle, it's got round, it's got sharp corners. Well, if you look at the real thing, you'll see that it has smooth corners on the buckle. That's very important. And uh, then it also has four stitches only on either side and five stitches down here and five there. So the details are very important whenever you're dealing with counterfeits and want to spot them right away. I got to tell you a story. Um, we had just moved to San Diego from uh, Mobile, Alabama, and our daughter had gone to us with some people from the church college group and had gone down to Tijuana. And so while she was there, uh, my daughter Becky loves her daddy. So she bought me a big imitation counterfeit Rolex watch. And I mean, it was one of the big gold ones, you know, with the big president bracelet and the symbol on the clasp and had the little bubble on the crystal and everything else. Well, we used to go to a Kmart that was there in El Cajon, where we lived, and to write to pay with a check, you had to go to the customer service desk and have the check stamped. 
after producing all this identification. And we used to joke about maybe we need to bring the uh, birth certificates of our children and all that kind of stuff just to get in line and have our check stamped. And so this is 1985. So, <clears throat> so we would go there and the same little gal was always there and she was very nice and pleasant and would make me produce all of this stuff, you know. And uh, so I would, but one day we just happened to stop in there and I had on that fake Rolex, not for any special reason, but I just had it on. And so I went in there to the desk and th this is the one over there on uh, right across from Parkway Plaza. So I went in there and I got the checkbook out and I'm writing and I've got my arm here holding the check register down and she looks at the watch. And I said, you want to see my ID? She looks, she's looking at the watch and she's going, no, that'd be okay. Yeah. So based on a fake, I got my check approved. But that's how powerful sometimes fakes are. You know, and we even know people who are fakes and they have a lot of influence. But you see, one of the things we need to understand is that kind of stuff is funny in the natural realm and even you can, yes, you can get a purse for 10 bucks instead of 100, but that's not the issue. You see, that's okay in that kind of stuff. Yes, you are cheating somebody. Uh, yes, you are helping China, but that's not the thing that we're worried about in counterfeits. What we're worried about is we're concerned about people being led astray from God's path for their life through counterfeits. So John writes this passage here. And he says, dear friends, he's writing to us, dear friends, don't believe all the people who say that they have the Holy Spirit. Instead, test them. Okay, I'm going to give you a test. You know. No, it's, it's what you're doing is you're watching them to see and you're praying and asking for discernment. We're going to help you figure out how to do that in a minute. See whether the spirit that they have is from God because there are many false prophets in the world. There are. Um, how many of you have seen the ads pop up on your internet? Buy gold, yeah. sell silver, get platinum, get plutonium. No, you can't get plutonium. Um, they have all of these things that the end is nigh. Get get the food that's going to last forever. You know, just uh, all of these things are playing into fears, and some of them are counterfeit for the real thing, the real life that comes from Christ. So what we're going to say is that every person who declares that Jesus Christ has come as a human has the spirit that's from God. Now, why does John say that? In John's day and time, there was a group, a religion that had started up right around the time of Christ, and it's called Gnosticism. And so you can use that on your friends. And even there's another kind called Docetic Gnosticism. But I'm just going to tell you that these people did not believe that Jesus came in the flesh because they felt that everything that was made out of material substances like your body was evil. I know sometimes we think of people and they could be, we could be thinking that way. But what we're thinking about is did God create humans inherently evil? No. God created humans in his image and then humans made a choice to believe the lie. And so what they did was they believed that everything material, even that creation was a mistake. And God's finger slipped from one button to another and presto, we have the world. And so Jesus had to come down and that was an accident and it wasn't really, Jesus isn't really God, but he's just kind of something that happened along the way to show us light. And so whenever we look at these kind of things, we go, oh, okay. If I embrace these beliefs, John's thinking, if I embrace these beliefs, I'm going to be moving away from the one true God. We see these kind of things today. If you're familiar with Buddhism, that's very much Gnosticism. There's also Zarathustraism. There's also a whole lot of other stuff like that that all falls into that same category. So you have to be careful because sometimes the words sound the same, but they mean something entirely different. And so what we do is we know that every person that, who doesn't declare that Jesus Christ has come as a human has a spirit that isn't from God, and it comes from the enemy. Mm -hmm. It comes from the enemy because you have not accepted Christ, therefore you have not been transformed, 
So therefore, you can't talk about what you can't identify with. So John is writing this, and he's saying, he's saying later on in the passage, he's saying that those people can't really understand what we're talking about because they don't belong to God, but you guys need to be aware because they're going to slip stuff into your consciousness, so to speak, that's going to be different and it's going to lead you astray. If I do not believe that God created the world, who did? Okay. If I do not believe that God is in charge of all my affairs in life, who is? It's not me. Okay. I have the choice to go along with what God presents, but God is the one that ordains our paths. If God was not with David, would he have been able to kill Goliath? No. So anything that has to do with God's purposes can be thwarted by this kind of thinking. So that's a lot of philosophy and everything else. Okay, so we have counterfeits in, in John's day, and so they have some of these crazy things that are going on that come from the Greeks, and so we find some of that as rem, reminiscent today. For instance, one thing that creeps in frequently is... If it's on the internet, it must be true. Okay? Abraham Lincoln said that. It was on the internet. It was on the internet that he said it. Okay, so we need to always go back, and I know you hear this a lot, but I'm telling you that you need to go back and, and you need to find out what the Bible says on a given topic, principle, or philosophy and then you'll discover what truth is because it was written by the Creator Himself, okay, through the Holy Spirit. And so whenever we look at that, we need to know, and probably one of the best examples is the people in a town called Berea, and Paul and Silas went to the Jewish synagogue, and they started teaching, and these people, instead of being like the Thessalonians and just rejecting Paul and Silas and wanting to attack them, they went home at night and studied God's word to see if what they were saying was true. And so that's, that's something that's incredible, is just the search for truth is not an esoteric event. It's evaluating what is said in the light of what God has said. So let me show you a picture here, and then I'll help you. Uh, I'm going to help you uh, learn how to sort this stuff out. Now, over here on the left is a large picture. And probably this, this large picture should have been on the right-hand side, but that's okay. So this picture right here is a classic one. It's Jesus knocking on the door. And we say it out of Revelation 3.20. It's knocking on the door of the heart. And there's a famous picture that shows it all included. You notice anything weird about the door? There's no knob. There's no door handle. Why? Because it's got to be open from the inside. Your heart has to be open to hear God, and then you open the door and he steps in. Now, one of the things, one of the things that's not shown on this type of door is what we call a threshold. Every one of your exterior doors will have a threshold. This is a threshold right here. This is a jam, J-A-M-B, not J-A-M. This is a jam. This is a threshold. Now, one of the things I'm going to tell you is that whenever Jesus comes, and knocks on the door, you can open it confidently. But if somebody comes and knocks on the door that you don't know, you don't immediately invite them over the threshold. That's right. Amen. That's right? right? Yeah. You want to know who they are. Mm -hmm. Who sent them? Where did they come from? What is the purpose of their visit? Should I invite them in, or should I not invite them in? Should I let them cross over the threshold into my house? You see, the same thing goes on with our mind, folks. Whenever we hear something, even what I'm saying to you today, the first thing that we need to do is we need to go, whoa, am I going to let that into my mind? Is there an actual physical threshold for my mind? No. There is a spiritual and there is a, and there is a God-given threshold that you have, sometimes we call it boundaries. What kind of boundaries do I have that I'm going to let something in? So if I say to you, you don't really need Jesus to be saved. Boo hiss. Yeah. Okay. Boo hiss is right. Because 
That one should not ever cross the threshold of your mind. Okay? Um, how about this one? I just need to know Jesus. I don't care about the Father or the Holy Spirit. Ooh, that doesn't come over the threshold either, does it? Um, how about if I tell you that um, you have to do everything you possibly can do to have a relationship with God, and then whenever you get to the end of yourself, then God will do the rest. See, it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? We like that because, hey, yeah, I'm going to work hard. Uh, don't let that one across the threshold. How about um, uh, I can be born again, but I don't have to hang around with them people. Okay? I'm doing just fine myself listening to my iPad, iPod, I whatever. Okay? See, those are thoughts that come our way in today's culture. Um, I can love you, brother, but I don't have to like you. How does that work? See, we don't let those across the threshold. So what we need to do is understand that the function of a threshold and a threshold in our thinking is to separate what should remain outside from that which we allow to come inside. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Whoa, come on in. Our Father which art in heaven, yes, come on in. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, yes, come on in. I'm doing pretty good. I don't need any help. Stay out on a porch. <laughs> See, so what happens is we form, every time we let something across here, whether we've let wrong things come across in the past or whether we're letting stuff come in now everything has formed a pattern so that every time I have a thought that comes my way that sounds remotely that sounds remotely familiar I am tempted to open the door of my mind and let it in and I should not do that okay here's one I heard this is really sad Yes, I'm married to Emma, but God told me it was okay for me to engage in adultery with Mary. No, that's ridiculous. I have heard Christians say that. How about this one? God has forgiven them. Why can't you? God also is going to judge them, not me. You see, there are all of these little things that we sometimes say in religious circles that we need to change and not be engaging in. God called us to walk in a way that is wildly different from the world, and we need to walk that way with Him, and then we will experience the peace, we will experience the joy, we will even gain happiness in a way that makes us secure in Him. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. I love this writing of John Bunyan called Pilgrim's Progress. And one of the things that he does after he leaves the city of destruction and he heads out, the first thing that he does is he misses the stones and the slew of despond. And he sinks up to his neck. He's got a friend with him named Pliable. In other words, Mr. Flexible. Mr. Flexible doesn't want any part of that journey. Christian manages to get pulled out on the other side by helpful. But you see, one of the things that he happens then is he stays on the path and he heads straight for the little wicked gate. You know what a wicked is? Have you ever played crochet? It's a little thing about this side, a little thing about that tall. That's what you hit the ball through to hopefully hit the stake. Okay? Yes. Yes. Should we let should we let the announcement about the weather cross the threshold of our mind at this time? No. Okay. It's going to happen. Yes, it's marvelous, and you can't do anything about it. Okay. So now, whenever we hear things, earlier we read and recited the Apostles' Creed. So if you look at it again, we can take and this is what. 
we can use to sort thoughts out. Does it line up with this? The apostles didn't write it. It's a summary of their beliefs. There are three sections. It talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it's a great one to use whenever somebody tells you something about God. Hey, he was, you know, he was just a good man. He was a great teacher. Not over my threshold. He was the original hippie. No, that's not coming over my threshold either. He didn't really die. He just swooned on the cross. No, that one's not coming over my threshold. It was a dead body that they picked up and put in the tomb. He rose again on the third day. Yeah, because he gained a lot of strength while he was in there and pushed the stone aside. No, that one's not coming over either. How about the one of uh, the disciples must have stolen the body? Oh, yeah, they overpowered the Roman guards. Come on. We know from the biblical account that that's not true. Because one of the unique things is that he appeared to women first. Nobody in that day and time did that. Women were to keep silent, stay at home. They could not even testify in a court. So they were not considered to be reliable witnesses. So we need to take thoughts like that as they come in through the threshold. And we need to say no. So whenever we go to something like the Apostles' Creed, that gives us the foundation of something that we can look at. Okay, what did Jesus say? Jesus said this. He said three things that are key for us. These will enable you to understand who is at the door. Because if it's anything different than this, you can just close the door gently and say, no thank you. Okay, the first one is this, John 11. I am, I am, that's the same words that God used to describe himself to Moses. The I am that I am. The self-sufficient, fully divine God himself of all creation and ruler over thing. Jesus uses those words and it drives those people crazy. But in this case, he says it to Martha. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. That's a promise. You can let that one over your threshold. See, it's easy to do. You can let it over your threshold. Let me tell you another thing. You know, sometimes we hear things, well, at our church, we do this. Well, you know, I believe that uh, men should wear three-piece polyester suits. Is that biblical? No. In the 70s, the big deal was, and the 60s was, you guys with long hair, ungodly. And then you show them pictures of Jesus. They freak out. <laughs> so those kind of things just constitute what I would call a personal conviction. That's your opinion. You're entitled to have it, but it doesn't mean that I need to fall under. Another one is like this. At our church, at our church, we say amen this way. We go, amen. So if you go to that church and you don't say it that way, right away all the heads turn and go, oh, visitor, huh? And so... <laughs> And so you can get caught in those kind of things. That's a community standard. You see, what do we what do we do? What time do we come in? You know, you know one of the community standards for here at Westview? Yeah. I can come in fifteen minutes late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See that's we we start on we start on uh, Mormon daylight time. Okay, always fifteen minutes late. <laughs> so that's one of our community standards. It's okay, you can come in fifteen minutes late. See, but you miss out on a whole lot of things. You missed out on us reading Psalm 24. You missed out on two songs. You missed out on worshiping the great God of all mankind. You missed out on experiencing the joy and fellowship of those that are here and those that could pray for you right off the bat. That's what you missed, but that's your choice. Okay? Now, so we got my personal opinion, not binding. We got the community standard, or here's what we do here, not binding. But if we say that you should be fellowshipping with other Christians and even loving your enemies, binding. That's right. See, so that's how you sort it out. See, if you go to another congregation, they will do things differently. Some churches don't even pass an offering bag. They pass a plate. Some churches don't even have that. They have a box in the back called the agape box. And so that's where you do it. See, so every one of those, neither one of those is a binding thing on me. 
What is binding on me is I need to return my tithe to God the Father through the place where I'm fed, and that happens to be the local church. Mm -hmm. So that's biblical. So you can see here that we can sort these things out in those different ways. And so it's not only what I'm going to let in over the threshold, but it's what am I going to do with what I have brought in over the threshold. So whenever we see that, so let's go back to these words of Jesus. Words of Jesus are like that. John 14, 6. I love it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't be my buddy unless you believe in me. No, 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 no. See, that's where it stops. It, sto it stops. Jesus is not your buddy. Jesus is your older brother. The purpose of the whole thing of Jesus' sacrifice was so that you could have a relationship with God the Father Almighty right. that was ruptured in the Garden of Eden by the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Right. Yeah. That's why. And so then that's why Scripture calls Jesus our older brother. Because he is there alongside of us. The Holy Spirit guiding us and helping us. And so that's an important thing. See, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. And so that means that it's only through a belief in him. Now, it says these two. John says this, John 20. This is the same John writing that we're looking at. And he says, but these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. You can let those over the threshold any day. They will affect how your house operates. They will affect how your life feels. They will affect who comes in and enjoys your presence. They affect all kinds of things. And so that's the important thing, is we have to be affecting other people and so we can do it by screening things through these kind of things. False prophets, if it's too controversial for them to explain fully and completely in line with God's Word, not going to happen. We were at a conference in Seattle one time, and a guy was speaking, a nationally known television speaker. He was a good, exciting speaker. A lot of people had come to see him, probably about 2,000 or so. But he made this offhand comment. He said, I don't care what you think. I don't remember if he said that or not. He said, but, yeah, he said, I don't care what you believe, but the bride of Christ is not the believers. And both Emma and I are going, what? That one did not cross my threshold. Did not cross my threshold. He didn't explain it. He just said it. You know, it's just for shock value, I guess. I don't know. That's like Charles Spurgeon one time from the 1850s. He said there are so many people. He was asked, he says, why don't you talk about the second coming of Christ? He said, because I know that it's going to happen in the Father's time. We don't know. 88 reasons why Christ's coming back in 1988. Oops. 89 reasons why Christ is coming back in 1989. Written by an aerospace engineer. So that makes it good, right? Not on my threshold. It didn't. Okay. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, that would be nice. He says, I always want Christ to return. But he said, if I say as he's coming back on a certain day, the chance of that happening are about Zippo. He didn't say Zippo. He said <laughs> nil. Okay. So he said, however, if I was to preach that Christ was not coming back on this day, the chances of him returning that day are far greater. Because God has a timetable of his own. So what do we do with all of this stuff? Well, the first thing is, is whenever you tend to think about something, think of it as a threshold event. Not everything needs to be a threshold event every time. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Automatic response, come on in, Lord Jesus. Take over my house. If it's something like, well, I don't know if he really was, if she was really a virgin, or was that just a word for young woman? You're staying out on the porch, dude. Yeah. Yeah. i got to believe what the Bible says. Right. 
because if she wasn't a virgin, then he was still tainted by sin. Therefore, he could not be the acceptable sacrifice for us. And therefore, we would not have life and have it more abundantly through him because he was just another human. See, all of these things seemingly insignificant, they really matter. What does it mean when Jesus tells us to love our enemies? That is a big one. That one's coming across my threshold. I'm going to think about it in the kitchen, the living room, the den, maybe the bathroom. I'm going to think about it when I lay down. I'm going to think about it all the time. What does that mean that I have to do? I've got to put aside, I have to put aside my preconceived notions of what God wants to do for me. So whenever we think about counterfeits, false prophets, false teachers, just like the 73 verses in the Bible that mentioned it, it's a pretty important topic. Because especially in this day and time, we get messages that come all the time. If you buy this new Cadillac STS, you will be happy. Really? You're not going to be happy with the payments, but you're going to be happy with the car. Okay, so is that something we need to set across our threshold? I don't think so. We need to sort those kind of things out. The messages that we get in the spiritual realm are a whole lot more subtle. Let me just tell you, I, I got finished putting a message together, and, and uh, I was laying down trying to go to sleep, and I was thinking about, I mean, all kinds of things. Like when I was growing up, when I was working in Colorado on a farm. I mean, all of these thoughts and everything. And I didn't let them over my threshold. But even more thoughts kept coming, time in the military, time in the deep south, everything. I mean, these thoughts were coming, you know, fast and furious. Have you ever had that happen? You know what that is? That's the enemy pounding on your door, trying to get across your threshold and get in your mind. Why? So that I would not be clear in providing you with an insight into God's word. So finally, I just, Satan, I rebuke you, and I remove you from my presence. And the knocking on the door went, stop. See, God wants us to be victorious. God wants us to let the right things in. God wants us to get the wrong things, get them out. Get them out. Have you ever had a salesman come in that you wanted to get out? <laughs> Don't let him cross the threshold. I'll tell you back to black stories. But you see, one of the things that we need to do is not only think right things, but we need to think things right. And so whenever we do, the best choice is for us to line up with God's word. That's the best place. Everything you need to know for life and conduct is in there. It even talks about uh, cars going at high speed. It says in the chariots and the vision, we're running amok at high speed through the city. So, um, you know, you can, can let that one across the threshold. No. Okay. So we can understand that everything for life and godliness is contained in God's word. We can find everything. God has given you wisdom. God has given you opportunities. God has given you everything. Why don't you stand with me now and we'll pray. And we'll close. And everybody's going, Man, that was too much philosophy for me. Yeah, I got to cross my threshold. Yeah. Let's pray. Lord, we just want to thank you so much for giving us the tools to be able to separate out truth from error, from falsehood, from heresy, from all of these things so that we can stay on the path. Mm -hmm. Just like it says in Psalm 112, that we can walk in a way that imitates mm -hmm. the way that you would have us to walk. Yeah. And so, Lord, we're so thankful for the tools that you do give us. We're thankful for your word. We're thankful for positive people who are pursuing a relationship with you and that they can help guide us too. But Lord, we're always going to check things out according to your word. And so as we think about this, we just thank you so much for being the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you, Father, for opening up the opportunity through Jesus Christ for us to be able to have true life in you. And so, Lord, as we celebrate our independence 200 and some years ago, we're so thankful that we can live here, but we realize there's an obligation we have to be involved in the process. We also have to maintain our status as one 
who can further work of the gospel in other places. And so, Lord, we're thankful for that. We ask you to bless us. We ask you to bless America. Turn them back to you. And we're going to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.